Welcome back to the Hot Pursuit Podcast brought to you by Lead Post, the retargeting platform built to help agencies increase revenue and improve ROI for their clients by identifying website visitors that don't convert. Learn more at leadpost.com slash agency. I'm Roy Harmon, and today I'll be talking to Christopher Antonopoulos, the founder and CEO of Measured Results Marketing. Thank you so much for being with us, Christopher. Thanks for having me today. I'm pretty excited about the topic we have lined up and yeah, a bit excited to get started as well. Yeah. And so today we are going to be talking about uh, lead gen, lead nurturing. We're going to uh, really cover a lot of the topics that people need to understand to get the most use out of uh, products like lead posts, how they need to really get the most out of any marketing efforts uh, because if you're going to generate the lead, you're going to want to nurture the lead. So can you talk to us a little bit about your background and how you got into the, the lead gen game? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I think it, it probably officially started in my network solution days. So it was sort of you know, one of my first, I'll call real jobs. And my role is to do analytics on website and um, build some of those nasty purchase flows that everyone hates today. So, you know, do you want to buy a domain name? And would you like to host your website? And would you like SEO services? And so um, my job was to optimize those flows to try to get people to buy more stuff. Um, then I got into marketing automation and moved over to this company called Tanberg and then Cisco Systems, where my job was to generate about 7,000 leads a day to support the collaboration infrastructure sales team. So um, had an awesome team, but I learned I learned the valuable lessons around integration between systems and how important data and relationships were. Yeah, you know, it's sort of you know, in that in this context, it's sort of, you know, if you don't have good data, if you don't know your relationship with clients or prospects, it's really hard to get past go. And so you know, that transition to what I'm doing today, which is um, have an organization that helps companies with their technology stacks. So from lead capture to close one opportunity, do you have the right set of tools? Are they all connected with one another? And ultimately, can you predict your what your revenue is going to be and then do programs and activities that can influence it all the way through the life cycle? So that's probably the last 20 years of my career in the last like 30 seconds to a minute here. But yeah, I'm happy to, happy to talk today and have a, a construct around that as well. It's uh, so you really, you've got a very in-depth holistic understanding really of the whole process. Um, and at a, a pretty large scale, um, you know, with the number of leads that you've uh, been responsible for generating at, at certain times. Uh, but then also, I think that you really, you've got a breadth of experience with uh, a number of different size uh, types of companies. So one thing that I think would be interesting to know more about at a higher level is just, there's kind of the, the lead capture, lead nurturing piece. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, the, or I should say lead uh, capture, lead generation piece, and then the lead nurturing piece. Uh, what would you say is the, how important is it that those two are kind of work together? Is that something where, uh, you know, can you take them in a silo or how? Yeah. I, yeah. I say, I say that, so we call it digital detective. So we, as you can tell, we have lots of fun with Yeti characters and you can see on the wall behind me, but yeah, I think for us, we call it digital detective, that first part of it, which is how do you get all of the right data about your customers, about your prospects, and figure out all the pieces? You know, where are they interacting with online? Are they a customer of yours? Are they a customer of a competitor of yours? What other technology do they have in their, their tech stacks? And so... Yeah, we call that digital detective internally. And so the idea is that we're trying to figure out all of those touch points, you know, all of those different areas where um, we can understand the relationship that we have with everyone better. 
So that's all well and good. I think the hard part is after that, which is, I think, Roy, part of what you were, you're, you're sort of leaning toward, which is, what do you do after you have that information? And that's where it gets a bit tricky in terms of, you know, how does this demand gen, lead gen, revenue ops role start to convert into leads and customers and those pieces in terms of nurturing? So for us, it's all one function. The role of being a digital detective and finding out that information and the nurturing part of it or building that relationship is probably a better way to say it, are sort of all connected. Because if they're not, or I, I can embarrassingly say they weren't originally for us. And so we had one team say, great, we generated 360 net new marketing qualified accounts. And they were excited. They visited the website. They came to a webinar. They downloaded a piece of content. And then it was crickets. So then sales said, wait, um, that's good, but these aren't ready for me to have a sales conversation with. What do I do now? And so that's the nurturing part of it, which is, you know, what is that process to nurture or build that relationship after you've identified them? Is it email? Is it using an AI tool to, to communicate with someone? And yeah, happy to talk about what works in that that realm as well. But I guess those are the two parts for me, which is digital detective, find out as much as you possibly can, and then converting that into appropriate nurture based on relationship, where someone is, and you know what's going on in this this outside world around us. And what's involved in creating a a really comprehensive but also consistent process to sort of guide people from from each stage because i know you've said that there's a lot more to it than just sales and marketing and i think that sometimes the different teams can get siloed yeah. and you've got some thoughts on that i believe yeah i i think that i mean we start with sales and relationships in the process and you know, build out I, I, sort of life cycle stages, customer journeys, personas, whatever word resonates with you. But what we start by doing is understanding the relationships we want to build. And then we look at, into, we look at sort of prospects and segments and where are they in that journey? We've just met. They've just filled out a form. They don't know who we are. This is a referral. Someone has you know, told someone about us. You know, we have some sort of reputation that's gained from that relationship. Where do we take it from there? This is a customer of ours. They bought something with us. They've, you know, we provided service for them. You know, what does that look like? This is someone who we did business with, let's say, a year, a year and a half ago and provided services. You know, now they're back engaging with us. What does that look like? So I, the first step for us is really what is what are the relationships we want to build and where are you in the cycle of those relationships based on the information that you have? Because you have to treat everyone differently. I mean, yeah, imagine, Roy, I just sent you an email saying, hey, Roy, I'm Christopher. I'd love to do a podcast and, and do X, Y, Z. Your response is probably like, who is this guy? You know, why are we communicating in the first place? Rather than the research that happened on both ends. Great. I, I've seen he's done this before. Here's some content that's interesting. You know, we're really interested in helping companies identify more prospects that are not identifying themselves. So it gives companies at bat or the opportunity to find new clients. Right. But that's but that that's stage one is sort of what relationship do you want? And then where are they in that? Where are they in that journey? Then you move to all the system parts, which is you know, lead scoring models are really helpful for that. You know, are they an ideal customer profile, creating those segments that then lead into either sending directly to sales for follow up, you know, sending an automated nurturing program or identifying them for identifying an individual for 
personalized follow up or you know more of a high touch high touch model so it sounds like on the one hand you've got the relationship side where uh personalization is kind of the key and then on the other side you've got the uh nurturing the um uh then the system mm-hmm. and with that system uh, especially the lead scoring component can you talk a little bit more about how you uh, you know you said that you didn't always have this system in place so yeah. kind of what led you in that direction and what do you think the best steps are to take for other people to move that way sure i mean yeah necessity is the mother of invention and so you know when you see you know we we like lots of other companies and you know we built a workflow we enrolled someone in a workflow i'm sure you're familiar with that there's a seven or 10 step workflow over a three to four month period. You know, someone fills out a form, they get enrolled in that, they go through this journey. And if they're unlucky enough to click two or three times and it goes directly to a salesperson and then they're harassed until they either buy something or leave. So that probably sounds really, really familiar. And I can't say that previously in my career, I didn't use approaches like that and they were particularly successful. but now we're finding that the way the way you get started is understanding these initial buckets who's a customer of yours and making sure they're tagged in your database and they get put in a different segment that's not grouped with the the generic communications that you have so i think step one is knowing your customers what they bought and what that relationship is and building out what that experience is for them. You know, every X months, you're going to check in with them and see are they using their product and, um, you know, what is the relationship with you? If you're a services business, are you, are they happy with you? Are they providing feedback? But that's the place to start. Who are your customers? What is your relationship with them in terms of services, what they have bought or, whether they're engaged or not, because that was the most valuable segment for us. And then what about um, sort of, how about, is there some multi-channel approach that you recommend, or is this something where you really focus on email? What's the best way? It is. um, I mean, the, you have a little bit of grace in the context as long as you're being empathetic and you know, treating your customers particularly well. I mean, that that starts with email and those correspondence because they already know you. They're more likely to respond to a correspondence. Um, I'm finding people enjoy phone calls from people they know. So we've doubled down on really picking up the phone, talking to clients, talking to prospects because they want to talk to someone instead of engage with a screen. And then we use all the other ones. So LinkedIn is good for building relationships with people, but usually we're finding it's not as good at starting relationships. I'm sure you've gotten those as me as well. Dozens every day. It's very, uh, right. I, so I don't usually it's like a coin toss when I get a connection request on LinkedIn. Uh, are they going to immediately try to sell me something or are they going to wait two two, uh, two messages to try to sell me? Exactly. But it's, so it's email first, you know, depending on relationship and value of customer, it's a call. People miss that, believe it or not. And then those other channels reinforce it. So if you're talking about, you know, Instagram, Twitter, X, LinkedIn, a lot of those other social channels. And then it reinforces it with channels like this for podcasts and those pieces. So, you know, what what individuals are trying to do now and companies are trying to validate, hey, look, we've potentially reduced our marketing department, marketing spend and services. And so we need to make every dollar count. And so we need to validate across all of these different channels that this is someone to work with. It's also um, justification for your clients to continue to work with you, right? If they're not seeing you in these channels, they're wondering sort of 
what's what's going on? Am I getting the best service? Am I getting thought leadership? Like, are they going to help me get to the next step? Or are they just providing services for what I need right now? So that was a very complicated answer. The simple answer is email and phone first, especially if you have that relationship. The other channels in my mind are used best to build those relationships and build that validation going forward. It's not to say that you can't build a relationship and people find you through these channels and posting in them, but maybe for us, it's a bit different. We see them as sort of ancillary channels instead of the primary place you go initially to go find someone. And what, how are you personalizing these, these interactions across channels? So um, we're using AI tools to show the information that we have about the client to a salesperson. So as an example, um, Mike, who is our VP of growth, will get an email with a, a company we want to prospect and work with. And it'll say, here's this person, here's the company, you know, do we have a relationship with them or not? Have we sent out a proposal to them? When is the last time they interacted with us via email, download, web behavior? And so, um, you know, again, for those ideal customer fit prospects, we provide that information and that's used to personalize message. I would say that a lot of times, again, we have to be more efficient with tools. So, you know, I, I suspect from time to time, there's an AI tool used to draft that initial communication but it's based on all that data and then it's personalized on a one-by-one -one basis. I mean, for us, we're talking about hundreds of correspondence, not thousands of correspondence. And so for a company we really want to work with and we really think we can help, that approach works particularly well. I've, we're, we're, we're good at being detectives and knowing also when we get a generic message. It's very yeah. easy to see. Hello, Christopher, or I'll, I'll, I'll play this back to you. Hello, Roy, you have a very impressive background on LinkedIn, and I believe we can help you in fill in the blank. I saw that you have a podcast called Fill in the Blank. Would love to talk about how we can help you promote that to a larger audience. From sales at nameofcompany.com. Right. So that doesn't, that doesn't work particularly well anymore. So we have a, well, we call it spear phishing and net phishing. That, that's not any different than um, you know, what you hear in the marketplace, but there are these targeted accounts that we will do all of our research, have the targeted communications, reach out on other channels once we built that initial contact. And then there's individuals we haven't met or built that relationship with. We will still do that research, but it's not going to be as personalized as someone who we are really targeting and, and really channeling to work with. Tell me a little bit more about when you're personalizing that first message. What are some of the best practices to get to put together a message that somebody's going to answer? I mean, I think a lot of it is knowing and researching the company and understanding where they are, where they are in a dynamic of a group, right? So it's, um, I won't name this group, but there's a, there's a group of CEOs for SaaS startups and, you know, they've worked together for a while. They go through a boot camp, And so, you know, I know that most of those companies are venture funded. And I know that a lot of the challenges setting up the infrastructure, growing really quickly to demonstrate results for investors. And then I look at, are there any additional press releases? Is there any information about that? And then is there any industry research out there? You know, what is growth in sector? So, I mean, it's a lot of work, but it's relating to it. Great. I've, we've worked with other, we worked with other organizations within this group. These are typically challenges that they're having. And in the market today, we're seeing a lot of companies bringing in and hiring resources rather than outsourcing it like that's very specific challenges to that to that individual or that company that i'm or even sales is 90 percent certain that they're having then it's 
you know, providing some additional value. You know, someone's not going to hop on a call with you after an initial email. So, hey, here's content or here's what we're seeing another organization like yours doing. You know, let, let's, let's talk about, you know, does this resonate with you or is this a challenge? And then if it is, you know, let's talk or would you like us to continue to send you content like this? Right. It's the whole dating versus, you know, asking for a call or do you have 15 minutes to spare or, you know, this is not a sales call, but it's, it's really personalized at that level. But we're seeing response rates upward of 60% for those correspondents. Right. So, so it's worth it. So for that content, mm -hmm. where do you fall on the gated content debate? Are you just putting that out there free? Um, yeah, no. we, we look, we, we know who we're sending emails to, right? I mean, it, it's pretty, you know, if you're targeting through LinkedIn or you're using a tool like Zoom Info or Sales Intel or that to identify companies that make that fit, you know who they are on LinkedIn, you know who the individual is, you have their email address. Um, you know, you don't really need to ask someone for that. At most, we use it for validation. Does that make sense? So it's a pre-filled form for a piece of content where mm -hmm. it's, okay, um, great, you want these pieces. Here's who I think you are. Can you provide us some more information for progressive profiling? You know, of these five things, what do you think is a challenge? And you check a box in a list. But for the most part, we don't really gate much content. Because we know who we're sending it to and we're very targeted. Got it. Right. The only exception would be is if we're doing a broader campaign. So if you're doing a um, like a paper lead type campaign or something like that, then you would have gated content. So you have you know, first party data of someone filling out a form. But that's probably only relevant in 15 to 20 percent of the time. So I won't say never, but that's not the first the first point where you look at to gather it. You should know them first, right? So if you're reaching out to someone who is not your target audience or not someone you think you can help solve or fix for, then you're sort of wasting time and resource by, you know, buying a list and, you know, keeping your fingers crossed and hoping you got someone when they were paying attention, had a really good day, and are inclined to respond to like those type of those type of requests. In so today, with all the AI out there, um, and all the people selling things right now, yep, it has never been more important to really be able to generate true, authentic relationships. Yeah. So, could you just give us your number one tip on? what people need to do to create those kinds of relationships, because it is yeah. not easy. And I think a lot of it's because of what we talked about earlier. We're so, we're so used to somebody on LinkedIn. Maybe they act like they want to have, you know, some kind of a true yeah. networking. We have but a then the next respect for you and we can do business together and let's be partners. And right. I mean, the number one tip is to be a digital detective, be very focused on who you want to build relationships and spend time and and do your homework because that that comes across. So I will I will share this. So um I write a lot and outline a lot of the content that gets put on. And I did an experiment as many of us have done and had help with that exercise or you know have someone ghostwrite it. I can tell you that for the stuff, and I don't have anyone ghostwrite for me anymore, but for the stuff that was ghostwritten, it only got a fifth of the number of impressions or clicks as something I actually wrote myself. Like people know the difference. And so you have to be genuine and um, empathetic and put yourself out there um, in order to build those relationships. You have to write your own blogs. You have to, you know, have conversations like this one. So the number one tip is be very targeted and very deliberate in who you want to spend time with, 
who you think you can help and just be earnest in doing that. And the relationship stuff comes along from that. You, you can't awesome. force it. And some people don't want to be your friends. Like some people, yeah. you know, I'm allergic to the color blue, Christopher, we can never talk again because you've got lots of blue in the background, but you also have to be accepting that it's not going to work. Not everyone's going to be best friends. Not everyone's going to want to build a relationship uh, either from a, either from a business or a professional level going forward with you. You just have to be, you communicate that. And those are the people that you're best able to work with and help going forward. That's the other, that's the hard pill to swallow, right? You'd love everyone to, that you reached out to say, Hey, that's great. Let's have a conversation. I think you can help us with X, Y, Z. Um, but that's not always the case, but you'll find that building this has an exponential effect in growing those relationships going forward, opposed to just trying to make things fit that don't. Right. Right. Like if I hated doing podcasts, you'd never hear from me. And so if you sent me 50 messages and I corresponded back that this conversation wouldn't happen. So why my, my uncle says this, and I'm, I'm saying it more and more often these days is that you can't force nature. You can't force fit things that are just really not meant to be. Yeah. My, uh, I've got uh, two and a half year old twins and they they're still playing with the shape, the shape sorter. Yep. And uh, you can't fit that triangle into the square, uh, into the square space. No, but when they get older, like my son, they, they discover a thing called a hammer and saw and whatever else. And so they break the edges off so they can get it into that. But <laughs> then they, they can never to. get in the other thing again. Right. <laughs> so, so don't be that person who's trying to knock the edges off the square to get it in the circle. Cause it takes a lot of effort. And although you may be able to force it in once, it's not repeatable. Right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being with us. Can you, I know you talked a little bit about it before, but can you talk to us a little bit more about measured results marketing and the kind of people sure. that you work with? Yes. I mean, for us, we, we exclusively focus on B2B companies and we help them with their infrastructure everywhere for the process from lead capture to close one opportunity. You know, make sure all of those bits fit. You don't lose any leads along the way. And then your sales team are focused on the people who are interested in having conversations rather than you know, just getting leads sent across. So we are essentially help build infrastructure for companies. And then depending on where you are, we can train you on how to use it and then utilize us as a technical expert, or um, we can train you to use the system yourselves and then bring us in when you have something ambitious you want to do or something that's broken and you can't figure out how to fix. So that's sort of the, the world we live in and sort of how we, how we fit. And uh, is there anywhere people can go to follow you and uh, hear more yes, of your insights? I'm I'm almost everywhere at, at Find Your Yeti. Um, so we have a bit of fun with brand and then at measured results, but we have um, a LinkedIn company page. We also have a LinkedIn community called All Things Ops, Revenue Ops, Marketing Ops, Sales Ops. If you want to get tips around you know, how to fix your infrastructure, have questions that we can help you with. And then awesome. you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm you know, as long as you have an earnest question that you need help with or want to actually build a relationship, I'm always open to those things. But, you know, please don't send me. You should give them a code things. word so you know if they actually. Uh... Oh, that's good. We'll know if they listen to this. So, yeah, you can, if you include the word asparagus in the context <laughs> of your in a sentence or a PS at the end, I will know you're a real person. That's right. Well, thank you so much, Christopher. That was really great information. I really appreciate your being with us. No, thanks for having me today. I really enjoyed it. And hopefully this helps a few people figure out where to get started and, and get a bit better in finding, finding prospects and turning them into customers.